Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church of Farmington. Uh, I think you can tell that Vacation Bible School is almost upon us, and um, it's looking fantastic. I, I didn't go downstairs this morning, but last Sunday when I was down there, it looked amazing. And um, let's see, anything you need to share about VBS? Um, we're, we've got one more week to go, so it's all exciting. And anybody you know that has kids that might want to come, let them know to register um, on our website. Also, if we could have some help <laughs> moving the furniture this morning. Um, I know it's last minute, but we just need to move the table up and the pulpit down. So, and right after church, it's right after church. So. Okay. So, if anybody has some extra fortitude and are willing to help, that would be great. All right. Thank you for helping. Uh, this week is the 4th of July picnic in the park. I think Stephanie's still on vacation, but uh, if you signed up to help, remember what your shift is and what you're doing. And I don't know if we still need ice or desserts, but I'm sure it wouldn't be turned down if somebody brought an extra cooler of ice and, and whatnot. Um, yes, ma'am? Which I'll be in the kitchen. Yes. Yes. Earlier, I'll be in there, but not Okay. So the earlier you can bring your pies, the better it is, because it takes some time to cut them, bag them, label them, and whatnot. So uh, there'll be someone in the kitchen from 9 o'clock on, and you can always just leave them on the counter. Anything else with 4th of July? Yes, Pat. Brady does, right? Put on the rain or shine? Is there a possibility of rain? Okay. Can you do that? And uh, maybe a little blip about bring your pies early? Okay. Um... There's not going to be fellowship time today. We do have somebody signed up for next week, I think. But after that, we've got a couple holes. So if uh, anybody is able to do that sometime before you leave today, sign up on the sheet that's back there by Brady. Oh, it's going around? OK, it's going around. OK. Uh, let's see, anything else? Oh, bulletins, as usual, are available on the table in the back. Any other announcements? I know newsletter articles would normally be a going in soon, but with VBS and Stephanie being gone, it would probably come out late. But if you have something for the newsletter, send it on in. Anything else? All right. If you would like to participate in the passing of the peace of Christ and are able, I will invite you to stand up in just a moment. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Come on, stand. Come on, stand.
I invite you to stand if you are able, and we will join in our call to worship. Touch us with your presence, O God. We will respond with worship that is joyful and free. Touch us with your presence, O God. We will hear the word spoken for us and for our faith community. Touch us with your presence, O God. We will experience the revealing, healing power of the Spirit. Touch us with your presence, O God. And we will be your compassionate presence to others. Our opening hymn is number 385, All People That on Earth Do Dwell. Because of such great mercy, God is ready to forgive all the ways that we fail to live in faithfulness. Relying on that mercy, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. Let us pray together. Trusting you does not always come easy when each day we are faced with the ugliness of the world. We do not believe that love conquers fear. We are not convinced that power comes through weakness. We cannot conceive how you could heal us. Forgive our lack of faith, O oh God, and renew our trust in you, for we would be disciples of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God loves us, forgives us, and frees us from our sins. Therefore, be at peace and love with boldness and with generosity. Children, please come forward for a time.
Good morning. How are you? Good. Are you ready for vacation Bible school? Yeah. Yeah? Are you going to be a helper this year? <coughs> hmm? Not yet. No, not yet. You're one more year? Two more years. All right. Okay. So, do you love Vacation Bible School? Yes. How would I know that? What shows that you are excited about Vacation Bible School? Does this do it? <laughs> no? Hmm. Does that do it? Hmm. Does that do it? No. no. Hmm. Hmm. What would do it? How would I know that you're excited about something, that you're really looking forward to it? Yes. Happy. I'm happy. Hmm. What would that look like? Oh, look, I see smile. Oh, <laughs> I pointed. I saw smiley faces. I tell you what, come stand up here. And turn around. And we're going to ask them to help us know that they're happy about something. We're going to see if we can feel it from them. Okay, so look all the way around. Do you see? Oh. <laughs> How'd they do? <laughs> they did good? Okay, you can sit down. Can you do better? Oh! <laughs> Let me see your best happiness. She wants to, uh, do you want to do that? Yes. No. <laughs> you can do it. Do you want to do it? Like, okay. Come on, let's go. So sometimes um, we can feel how someone's feeling, you know? You can look at them and you can see it. Sometimes we don't always get it right, but a lot of times we do. Like, you can tell sometimes when someone's bored. Are you ever bored sometimes? What do you look like when you're bored? No. Right? What about when you're mad? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, shaking your head. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. So, in our uh, sermon today, which you probably will go, I don't know if you'll go down there or not, but we're, we're going to touch just a little bit on the fact that sometimes Jesus can feel what we're feeling, too. Okay? All right. Ready for a prayer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hands together. Bow your head. Close your eyes. Gracious God, we thank you that you gifted us with feelings. Sometimes they're hard. They make us cry. And sometimes they're scary. Ooh, and make us shiver. And sometimes they're great. And they make us all feel warm and smiley. We thank you for those feelings that you've given us. And we are excited for those times that we have a really great time, like Vacation Bible School, when we learn more about you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You can go back to your seats or get a thing. Is anybody, are they gonna go that way? Yeah, Cozy will go with them if they wanna go out that way. Grandpa is babysitting Lily today. All by himself. 
Our gospel lesson for this morning is from the gospel according to Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. Listen for God's holy word and the good news. Jesus crossed the lake again. Remember, he's been going back and forth and back and forth. So he's crossed the lake again, and on the other side, a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Jairus, one of the synagogue leaders, came forward. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded with him, My daughter is about to die. Please come and place your hands on her so that she can be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A swarm of people were following Jesus, crowding in on him. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and had spent everything she had without getting any better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Because she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. She was thinking, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Her bleeding stopped immediately, and she sensed in her body that her illness had been healed. At that very moment, Jesus recognized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and he said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, don't you see the crowd pressing against you? Yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus looked around carefully to see who had done it. The woman, full of fear and trembling, came forward. Knowing what had happened to her, she fell down in front of Jesus and told him the whole truth. He responded, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your disease. While Jesus was still speaking with her, messengers came from the synagogue leader's house, saying to Jairus, Your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? But Jesus overheard their report and said to the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid. Just keep trusting. He didn't allow anyone to follow him except Peter, James, and John, James's brother. They came to the synagogue leader's house, and he saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and, he, and said to them, What's all this commotion and crying about? The child isn't dead, she's only sleeping. They laughed at him, but he threw them all out. Then taking the child's parents and his disciples with him, he went into the room where the child was. And taking her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, young woman, get up. Suddenly the young woman got up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. They were shocked. He gave them strict orders that no one should know what had happened. Then he told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this story to me always has two potential um, teaching moments, challenges to it, and I have been really wrestling with it, because there's faith and fear, and then there's energy, good energy and not so great energy, and I was trying to figure out, okay, which one am I going to do, and I took a break, and I went into Home Goods, or a couple of things I needed to get from um, couple of stores in that little strip mall near my house. And so I went into Home Goods and I'm, you know, just looking for a couple of things. And I passed by one of the end caps that have coffee mugs on it. Everybody knows the Ray Dunn coffee mugs. Yeah, I, some people know them. Yeah. And, and there it was. And my husband knew I was wrestling. So I came home from the store and I said, 
Well, I guess I figured out what my focus is. I don't have to wait any longer. He goes, really? I pulled the coffee mug out and it said, faith before fear. It's like, okay, <laughs> that's going to be my focus. But I, I am going to put a little touch of the energy in and I chose to talk to the kids about it this morning too. So faith and fear are very interesting dance partners. I believe they dance their way through our lives in a variety of dance styles. Some days it feels like fear is spinning faith constantly in a very wild polka until the point that faith is on the edge of surrendering completely to the fear. And other days it feels like faith is leading, but it's engaged in a tango that's very intense. And on the very best days, faith is firmly leading the dance, and fear is reduced to the size of a toddler that is securely wrapped in the arms of her daddy. As you watch them, you have the sense that, that the second the daddy lets the toddler go, she's going to be running amok, amok, causing all kinds of chaos. But for the time being, she is in complete control of faith and is practically lulled to sleep. But faith and fear are not tangible in ordinary ways. We don't have a mood ring that outwardly identifies that we're letting faith take the lead or when fear is driving us. However, all people emit a sort of energy. It can be positive or it can be negative. I think the energy of a community of people can linger for a long period of time in a space that they inhabit regularly. If you are at all sensitive or if you're taught how to feel it, you'll pick up on it when you walk into certain places. And that can give us clues about which is in control at any given moment, faith or fear. I'll never forget the early fall of 2004. I got to go to a Cardinals playoff game. It was cold and wet, but the energy in Bush Stadium was electric. The excitement was palpable. The crowd roared with anticipation even before the game ever started. When we started coming from behind, I'm sorry, I was rooting for the Cardinals at that time. When we started coming from behind in the close of the game, that positive energy was overwhelming. There was literally no way the opposing team was going to win. We were just sure that all of our positive energy would pull the Cardinals from behind, and it did. We won. On the other hand, you can just walk into the house or an office and know that you're about to hear bad news. Sometimes for me, even, I can pick up the phone and in the inhale of breath on the other end, I can tell. Even before the words come out, you can tell by the visual clues and maybe the energy in the room that you're going to hear some bad news, that someone died or lost their job or messed up big time. A friend of mine who was a, who, well, she's kind of retired now, so she still kind of is an interim minister specialist, had told me a story of interviewing with a big church. She was so excited. It sounded like such a good fit. And it was a big congregation with a big budget, and they were looking for a head of staff that could manage conflict, which was her specialty, and it even came with a big paycheck at just the right time because she was putting her younger daughter through college. But the minute she walked in the doors of the building, that negative energy began to overwhelm her. And by the time the interview was over, she was physically ill. She knew that the church was not the one that God was calling her to. She was not willing to sacrifice her personal health for a paycheck. When the negative energy is very strong, it takes a lot of faith, a lot of skill, it takes some risk, prayer, and possibly sacrifice to overcome it, to turn it around on the part of everyone that's involved. 
Today's passage from Mark tells the story of the interplay between faith and fear and between negative and positive energy in the lives of two families, the family of Jairus and the family of the woman with a hemorrhage. A synagogue leader, a family man, comes to Jesus with an urgent plea. His daughter is dying. There is hardly anything that scares a parent more than the possibility that a young life, their child's life, will be over long before they've fully lived. Jairus is a man of faith, a believer in God, who's counting on Jesus to be able to heal his daughter and prevent his greatest fear from spinning his life out of control. And so they set off to his home. Meanwhile, there's a woman, too, who has great faith, a woman who had hemorrhage for 12 years, and she was desperate. When women bled in those days, they were considered unclean. They weren't allowed to be in the company of men. They weren't allowed to even leave their homes. While they were bleeding, they were treated a lot like lepers. Living 12 years in this fashion is almost unimaginable. This woman had faith that just touching Jesus' cloak would give her enough healing energy to change her life. Faith is in full command of her life at that very moment. Can you even imagine her nervousness and her anticipation as she got closer and closer? Can you imagine her hopes rising as she felt his positive, powerful, healing power? Can you picture her rushing away quickly, hoping not to be detected as a hemorrhaging woman out in a mixed crowd who would surely be punished by stoning, anxious to get home? to confirm that her bleeding had indeed stopped. Her whole life, her whole family's life, would be changed if she could just get home undetected. Can you imagine her panic as Jesus announces that someone has touched his cloak and he wants to know who it was? And instantly, her whole body's overrun with fear. Now, fear is in charge. The fear she didn't give any credence to suddenly takes over. Could it be that she misjudged Jesus for one who would heal without exposing her sin? By the law, she should be stoned to death for coming out into a crowd while she was unclean. Was he going to expose her? Would he throw the first stone? But Jesus affirms her faith letting her know that her faith had indeed guided her down the right path, and the fear subsides, and she returns to her life and her family, restored and renewed in her faith. Meanwhile, some mourners make their way to Jairus and Jesus and inform them that Jairus's worst fear has come true. His daughter is dead. And Jesus, knowing that fear has just taken over big time, reminds Jairus not to give in to it. He says, do not fear, only believe. He's telling Jairus to trust his faith that led him to Jesus in the first place and not give in to the negativity. He's reminding Jairus of the event that just happened to the woman with the hemorrhage. Her faith drove her to Jesus too. Grasp on to that. Hold on to that with all your might. And so they continue. Even in the face of the laughing, unbelieving mourners, Jairus and Jesus and the three disciples continue on in faith. The little girl will be okay. The little girl will be okay. Now I imagine as the rest of the family joins them and they go into the little girl's room, they must have been filled with panic and the negative energy would have been palpable, maybe even overwhelming. They can hear the public mourners outside wailing and crying. They can see their daughter lying very still, an unusual thing for a 12-year-old girl in the middle of the day. 
and I can imagine that they're trying to breathe in the faith and expel the fear, and they watch. Talitha Kum, little girl, get up. And she did. She got up. Faith got the upper hand. And Jesus orders them to get her something to eat. Get on with life as normal. Don't allow fear to sneak back in. Don't question that she's back. Now, the ultimate truth is that someday that little girl died. We don't know when it was. We don't know if she died even a year later. But we can hope and believe that when she died, those around her had a firm grip on their faith and would have been ready to let her go without fear and negativity ruining the rest of their lives. Faith and fear dance their way through our lives. We all know that dance well. We can feel the difference in our bodies when fear has got a hold of us. Our hearts race, our breath quickens, our guts tighten. If we pay attention, we can hear and feel fear speaking and spreading negativity all around us. We hear it on the news a lot. We hear it in the speech of our neighbors and it even comes from our own lips sometimes, it has an unmistakable quality. Who moved the expensive vase left to me by my grandmother? Where is it? Why would anybody move it? It's probably lost forever and I'll never get it back. That's fear speaking. It's fear of change. Someone changed something and we didn't know it and makes us worry that all the other things that we aren't expecting to change just might. It's fear of loss. Our grandmother died and we're afraid we'll lose the object that she gave us. But even deeper yet, we're afraid that her significance in the world will be lost and someday our significance will be lost too. The dance of fear and faith will be with us our entire lives. It's a normal dance, one that Jesus spoke to a lot. It's a dance that he named over and over again, but he didn't chastise people for engaging in the dance. He simply called them to let faith take the lead when fear had a death grip on life. How can we begin to choreograph our dance with fear and faith? There's a Native American story that probably many of you have heard that gives us some guidance. One day an old Native American grandfather was talking to his grandson and he said, you know, there are two wolves fighting inside all of us. The wolf of fear and hate and the wolf of love and peace. The grandson listened and he looked up at his grandfather and asked, which one will win? And the grandfather replied, the one we feed. Fear is normal, but we must not allow, we must not feed it or allow it to run the show. We cannot let its negativity take over our hearts. And we each must commit to letting faith take the lead in the dance of life. For Jesus calls us also to get up and to rise above fear and allow faith to move us forward in our daily lives. Amen. We join now in singing a classic hymn, number 465, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and if you're able, I invite you to stand.
Do we have any birthdays in the house? No birthdays today? All right. Joys and concerns, what would you like to share today? Mickey. I have a huge joy. <laughs> oh, hang on. Bonnie's going to get you the microphone. Thank you, Bonnie. A huge joy. Yay. Yeah, I can. My brother Tim and his wife Mary from Arizona are visiting us. And then about noon, there's going to be approximately 35 Murphy-related people showing up in our fellowship hall for a wonderful reunion. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Who else? Uh, Liz? Several months ago, I asked for prayers for my friend um, at work, uh, Connie Barnes Green. She was from here in town. Her husband, Kurt, passed away unexpectedly Thursday night. So oh. just prayers for their family. Yeah, for sure. Who else? I just want to praise the Lord for our program, the Feed the Faith. Um, I think we fed 33 this last week. 33? I think it was. Wow. So... It's just, and, and we've gotten such wonderful feedback, and it's, it's something that I've just, as a church, I think it's a great thing, and I just, we appreciate the support and the help and, and the encouragement, so. Yeah, thank you for your time and using your talents and, and whatnot. Thank you so much. I'd put a... Thank you note in your box from somebody. So. Go ahead, Jody. Well, I was going to ask, you know, we're starting. Well, you know, we're starting to plan for the July one. So any names, um, you know, um, sounds like we might have one on the list right now. So any names, any ideas, just anything. And um, plan it towards the third or fourth week of the month. Um, we'll do a day where we you know, prepare, try and do it after church, you know, so more people can be there. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, thank you. But yeah, and it's spreading. The other church people are contacting our church people about it too, so that's really good. Other churches are contacting, oh, nice. So it truly is becoming a community yeah. ministry. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Awesome. Um, I'll ask for prayers for my mother who fell Thursday. Was it Thursday? Yeah. Um, and um, she has a, a, she's very confused. The, the whole thing is throwing her for a loop. She has a broken finger that we know of for sure. She forgot to tell them that her feet really hurt at the hospital. Um, but she's supposed to call an orthopedic um, clinic on Monday and um, find out what's next. So hopefully she'll remember to tell them. Um, actually, I think my brother's going to try to call and talk to the orthopedic clinic if my mom can find the card. Um, so anyhow, she's, she's really scared right now. Um, fear has definitely got a hold of her. Um, and I think it'll be better once she knows what's going to happen next. Um, so prayers for healing and for some uh, plan to come forward quickly. So that would be appreciated. Anyone else? Let us pray. God of grace and love, we ask that you be with all the people who are on our prayer list that we haven't spoken of this morning, and we ask that you inspire people to continue to care for 
Um, those who are in need of assistance or in need of hope or healing, we ask that you be with the family that recently experienced the loss of their loved one. We pray for a really meaningful time at the Murphy family reunion today. We pray for my mother and we give such thanks for you inspiring members of this congregation to give of their time and their talents and, and the money that has been um, given to us by the Synod and by other individuals and, and whatnot to monthly feed people in need of a meal for oh so many reasons. We thank you for your inspiration and the energy that you provide that sustains this ministry. We know, oh God, that sometimes just giving someone a meal out of the goodness of your heart says so much and can bring a measure of faith to people who didn't know that they even needed it. We thank you for stories of healing, for lives that have been changed, for those times when fear can lessen its grip on our lives. We ask that you be with us in this next week, a time of celebration, a time of a lot of travel, and we pray, oh God, that you will help people make wise decisions as we celebrate together and as we visit with one another and as we move about this country. We especially thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and together we ask that you here, we ask that you hear us as together we pray together when he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now have an opportunity to bring forth our gifts. Let us now do so.
Let us pray together. Holy God, thank you for giving us a joy for generosity and a genuine love for those who are in need. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts and upon our lives that together we may bring healing and hope to the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 547, Go, My Children, With My Blessing. peace, trusting even where you have not seen. May God, our guardian, protect you, Christ the healer, restore you, and the Holy Spirit sustain you this day and forevermore. Amen.